Entrance of your word give it light and brings understanding to the meek heart. This morning we ask that you instruct us, correct us and empower us in the name of Jesus. Can we shout a better amen? amen. If you've been edified already, shout thank you, Father. All right, let's be seated. Amen. Amen. All right. This is our 10th or 11th Sunday under the canopy. Literally under the canopy. Literally. But the beautiful thing is we've had these services during the raining seasons without rain. So as you're seated, I want you to join us say thank you. Father. Can we just say thank you, Father, for good weathers? That being said, also, we are confident that this is our last canopy Sunday. <laughs> yes. We cannot be under the tent of God. <laughs> Praise God. So, uh, all things being equal, pray with us, pray for us. Uh, the installation of our marquee will begin tomorrow. Thank you, Father. Yes. Uh, do well to join us in prayers and in giving, which would mean we have to fill this place to a certain degree again, the inside. Our children, we can't be under the tent of God, and our children are still on that canopy. So we have to make a provision for them here. This new toilet will be for children in the time being. Amen. So do well to give. We need we will need at least six at least six trips of sand this week. Amen. To feel this place, to feel where the children are. But God has provided. Amen. Amen. Yes. If I be bold enough to say God has provided through me. God has provided through me. All right. The faith festival, I want to emphasize it to you. It's first for you. Primarily, God has instructed that the middle of the year we should. Go back to his word to us and feast on it. It's a, it's a form of lifting up the rod. When we lift up the rod, he said to Moses, I have given you the rod for signs and wonders. And that rod itself is actually the word of God. And that's how God comforts and guides. You see that now? He says, thy rod and thy staff, they what? Comfort me. And remember, comfort is not God telling you sorry. Comfort is God showing you the way out. So the way out of where you are is the word of God. So make our time. Take your excuses from work early. But just let it be your mid-year retreat. Praise God. So the way, are you all hearing what I'm saying? Please do communicate back so I can know you get it. So the way to handle the faith festival is to just design that period to be your mid-year retreat. Retreat. You see that now? So from the 15th to the 22nd, we'll be having a group fast as a church. So get ready. Start putting yourself in the know and preparedness. Amen. Amen. Then on the 23rd, is it 23rd? If it's 23rd, then it can be. When is the last Sunday? Huh? 25th. All right, so 25th will be our mid-year Thanksgiving. Has God been good to you? Some of you, you should understand this. Your business, your career, all those things should come in thanking God. You have seen the hand of God in your life, in your business, in your family. Come prepare to thank God. Two Thanksgiving a year, mid-year and end of year. Amen. Amen. So from January till now, we say thank you, Father, on the 25th. Those of us who are yet to tie our small banners, it's part of the ways we propagate the gospel of Christ. Amen? Amen? So what you do is just make sure you invite people to come for the faith festival. And it will be our first event under our marquee. Is that not beautiful? All right. So invite people. God bless you all. All right. All right. All right. Let's get into the word of God. We have begun this new series teaching ourselves how to pray. We started from Matthew 6, primarily the key text is verse 9, where Jesus was saying, so when you pray, pray in this manner. 
some version said, pray like this. So there is a manner to pray. And in this part of the series, we are actually studying the right way to approach God, the only way to approach God. And some of the things we have learned, just to bring us to a quick recap, is this. God is our Father. God is my Father. And He welcomes me. Amen? So I want to say that to yourself. Say, God is my Father. He welcomes me. And He delights to hear my prayers. So this is a sense of correcting the perspective. Now, even a three-star general who was a great war hero, a soldier, no matter how much re- uh, decoration he has, his children will not go to him and call him General Sir. Do you understand that? His children will call him what? Daddy. Are, are you getting the idea? So there's an idea that you may have of God. The Lord of the Sabaoth. It's true, he's the Lord of the Sabaoth. That is God's military title. For those of you who don't know what that means. In English, it means he's the commander of the host of heaven. Host being army. So you can say he's the commander of the armies of heaven. Indeed, it is true. He is the Lord of the Sabaoth. But to you, what is he to you? What is he to you? What is he to you? He is your father. And a father will always welcome. I want you to know this. That's why one of the reasons actually Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son is to show you the disposition of the father always. That even when we do wrong, the father wants you to come home. The safest place to go is home. Did you hear what I said? The safest place to go is what? Home. And that applies to your biological family too. Let nothing you do keep you from home. When even David disobeyed by numbering Israel and he was asked to choose his punishment, he said, let God punish me. I'm telling you, literally, that's what he said. Let God. Because God not go to me. So he went to God. Are, are you all getting the idea? The safest place to go is always where? Home. It's always home. No matter what you have done, they will scold you. They will beat you. But that is the least punishment you are getting. Because if God throws you out of the wolves, hey, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to what? And to destroy. But I am come, even if I come with a whip, that's what I'm even saying to you. Even if I come with a whip, if I whip you, it shall give you life. Everything that God does is good. Everything that God does is love. Even is correction. You know that? He says, the son who... The father loveth, he does what? Chastise. So even correction is God is a love language in God. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? So because they will correct you at home, you don't want to go home. You cannot face the humiliation. Ah, let me tell you the truth. There are places where you should not be embarrassed. There are the mo- anybody who wants to go far in life must have at least a small group of people before whom you cannot be what? embarrassed. I'm telling you. If I fall here, I fall here. And you, you correct me here. As iron sharpens what? Iron. So is a man's face brightening the countenance of his friend. Are, are you getting what I'm saying? So when I go and face the world, I'm ready because I faced you. Do you all hear what I'm saying? You should have real guys. Oh, walk into that place that you call your office. You say, this thing is not good. This thing, this thing, this thing. And you are not embarrassed. It's one of the uses of friendship to make sure you are prepared to face the world. Are you getting what I'm telling you? When strangers begin to tell you truth, it's an, an indication that the inner circle God gave to you is not functional. Let me give you a very colloquial illustration. Very, very colloquial. I remember when we were in school, I had two friends, very, very close, Kes and Oge. You know, Kes knew what clothing wear. He knew style early. When we were in school, he used to wear TM Lewin. Those ones that used to have the very long arc back. You know, the design evolved. So when you dress and you are going to school, 
Guess we see you on a bike go to sc- going to school. He will find a way to call you back home if you are badly dressed. No go disgrace me. Come this side. Do you understand that? You know, there are things a person does outside and they ask if he does not have family. I, I don't know if you understand that. You know, they don't get elder. There's a way you will dress hard. They will, they will know that people in your house, they don't like you. Because they are supposed to tell you that this thing where you wear it's not okay. And this is a correction to some of you because it's not part of our message. God is bringing it to some of you to understand the role of healthy relationships. There should be people who should be able to tell you at home that this thing you are doing is not, is not good. And if you are here, God has put people in your life who do doubt for you, but you are consistently fighting the structure. Understand that destruction is closed. Any man who will shield himself to the nourishment of correction in the small circle where God has planted him, destruction is very, very near him. For the Bible says to us, Psalms 68 and verse 6, it says God puts the solitary in families. He said, but the rebellious, that the one who will rebel against the family structure of God, that family structure of God entails a few things. It entails the fact that God will send a father to you. Even if you don't have a biological father, let me tell you the truth. There is none fatherless in the structure of God. Oh, this morning we'll hear the word of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, there's a door of utterance here. I said there is none fatherless in the structure of God. So when your biological father dies, God always sends people around you to father you. It, now the question is, are you open to be fathered? It's part of how God joins men who are isolated into what? Families. He sent a father structure to you. Take note of why I said it. A father what? Structure. He sent a father structure to you. And they can change periodically. Oh, you hear what I'm telling you? In a season, God will just send one guy. He will just be like a guy in that period. After that season, there is a kairos. It's over. God will send another. That's why it's a prayer. May my eyes see my teachers. Do you understand it? May my eyes what? See my teacher. God will send friends like Jonathan to prepare you to be king. Do you understand that? Yes. Jonathan taught David to be king. Ethics of the palace. It came from his friend, Jonathan. That's why some of you must know this. It's not everybody that is your age mate, that is your mate. If you don't understand it, leave it. There are even people that are older than in age that are your teachers. But that will robot and so-called man pride inside of you. You will not know when to stoop low and to learn. There are many people you are older than that are your teachers. God does not call us and position us in spiritual offices by age. No. He actually does that by preparedness. Level of preparedness. That's why when you come to churches like this, that is a discipling center, I urge you again, take your training. That will determine how God will use you, not how long you've been saved. When I see people say things like, I've been born again for 25 years. Oh, God, you are already being stupid by telling me this. Show your fruits. Show your what? By their fruits, we shall know them. By your fruits, we will know this man. You see, Peter did not have to tell, Peter and John didn't tell them where they were coming from, who they had been with, how long they've been saved, whether they cast their boats and their fishes and followed Jesus. Peter didn't say those things. But when Peter spoke, the people said, these ones have been with the Lord. Do you understand it? By their fruits, they knew where they were coming from. So these ones. So when you, don't say it if you are here. This is your correction. I've been saved for 25 years. We were all we were used to do this and this. At that time, don't say that. Anybody who is saying that is lacking in current fruits. Hence, he's hinging on previous fruits. <laughs> Did you get what I just said? He's lacking in what? Current fruits. God never deals with you with your past loyalty. God is always in the present. Because eternity, there is no wars. In eternity, there is always is. That's why when he introduced himself, he said, I am. If you are not faithful now, you are not faithful. If you are not loyal now, you are not what? Loyal. Don't shield yourself from correction. So God will bring people to you in the form of friends. Older, younger. That's why in your relationship called friendship, you must have honor. Because honor is a currency with which you receive. 
If you, if you lack honor, you can't receive. That's why there is a structure of people that God puts around you now that you may not be receiving from because you don't honor them. You don't honor them. Those of you who are from around you, low self-esteem is what causes you to always measure people when you see them. When you just see a person, just measure, always see you, look up, look up. I pass this one now. <laughs> I pass this one now. Let me tell you the truth. You would have gauged Jesus too, and you would have passed him too. In Marxist, you see people gauge him, and they look and pass him too. True or false? Even when he did something good, they say, ah, ah. Can anything good come out? If those men saw him on the street, they would have walked away. That's why the culture of honor must be big to you. Honor your friends. Honor your siblings. Honor your younger siblings. God puts something in them that you need. You are not siblings by mistake, oh. Did you hear what I said? You are not siblings by... By mistake. Yes, we have siblings who behave bad. And many times we wish they were not our siblings. If God let us choose, we will not choose some of our siblings. But that's why God did not let you choose. Because even you don't know what you need. If God let us choose, we will all, I say we will all, yours truly inclusive, we will all choose our destruction. I am telling you. Bible it makes it clear. There is a way that seemed right to a man. Choices that will be right to you. It says the end of that road is your destruction. So put honor in your all your affairs. You miss opportunities because you did not honor your colleague. Unnecessarily competitive. And the opportunity God wanted to bring was through that colleague that you are constantly in strife with. You will not hear it. So this morning, I believe that's all trans came by God just to bring correction. Have honor. Amen. I say have honor. Amen. Amen. So God is your father. God will always welcome you. And God delights. He does a dance every time you truly pray to him. One thing you should also learn is that you can never bother God. You know, when you talk to a person, you ask him for something today, you ask him for something tomorrow, you ask him, he says, sorry to bother you. <laughs> Have you not done it for him? He say, sorry to bother you. Please. I know, I know I was here yesterday. Sorry. Sorry. You can't do that with God. Do you hear what I said? You are not a bother to God. You're not coming to him. is a bother to him. He wants you to be here. He wants you to dwell in his temple. Do you get it now? So listen, you cannot over pray. There is no such thing as too much prayer. You can't wear God out with your prayer. He enjoys it. When you pray. You see, we learned that God has called us to a kingdom of priests. The way it is translated in the New Testament is that he has now made us priests and kings. Revelations 1 and verse 6. He has made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, as kings is our responsibility to rule. As priests, it's our responsibility to pray. But yes, interesting thing. We are only qualified to rule in the places where we have prayed for. So we rule by praying. So some of us have heard the doctrine that we are the kings. Inside king of kings. This is true. When they say Jesus is the king of kings, we are actually the kings. So tap your neighbor. You are a king. Oh, like this, you are a king. Say it well. Say it well. Say it well. Say it like a noble man. Some of you are talking like poopers. Poor people. No, no, no. Don't talk like the subject in the, com- in the, in the kingdom. Say you are a king. king. Like this, you are a king. Like oh, let's try it. It's royal majesty. <laughs> try it now. So when we now hear that we are kings in the majestic order of God, it's true. We now say we are kings. We don't walk. We don't this. We don't that. We don't do anything. Hmm. When it comes to pray, you will not pray. You are only as kingly as you are priestly. Did you hear me? You are only as what? Kingly as you are. It is through prayer you exercise your dominion. 
That's why, you see, the first word that was used for prayer in the whole of the Bible in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word, pala. It means to pass judgment. So in prayer, we pass what? Judgment. So if you cannot pray, listen to me, your authority on the earth is very slim. If you cannot pray, you cannot exercise authority. As simple as that. No matter how well you dress, you have no authority here. Because only with prayer are we able to exercise authority. Jesus is our example. As a priest who ruled in prayer. You know, you must understand a few things. That, is that Hebrews 11? No. Praise God. You must understand a few things. One of them is this. If you will not pray, you are not giving God a license to operate in your life. So if you sit down and you begin to say things like, God, go to arm, which is the escapist uh, mentality of many believers, many irresponsible believers we must add, God, go to arm. God will not do what we are not praying. Our saying Jesus is our example. He prayed while he was on the earth. Hebrews 5 and verse 7. I want us to see it. Put it in the Nas. Hebrews 5 and verse 7 quickly. He said, in the days of his flesh, that's when he was here on the earth, he offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Can you give us that in the Amplified? Because piety may seem big. But one thing, as they put up the Amplified, let me say, tell you something. You know, those of us who have the wrong ideology, that you know prayer, you don't have to shout when you pray. God hears you. There are prayers you pray that you must shout. You hear what I'm telling you? Eh? If you don't shout in prayer, something will do you for this life. You go shout by force. I'm telling you. If the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, God who came as man, he prayed loud and cried and cried. Brother, that thing that you are doing, while you are praying, and then you are even using your handkerchief, Lord, I thank you because I know you've done it. He's done it all. He's, <laughs> He's done it all. Thank you, Lord, because I know. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. It's not prayer. It's not prayer. You hear what I'm telling you? You're actually doing that because you think somebody's looking at you. You are not doing that for yourself. You know you are not doing it for God because God is not looking at your skin. Why men look on the outward, he looks on the inward. So if you are doing like this and you're changing, you're doing your, you know how some guys just be in church, just, you know, at least you know in your heart that the arranging of your shirt is not for God, true or false? Then why are you the dwam? You are doing it for somebody in church to see. It means you are not standing before God. And unto him shall the gathering of the people what be. I said sometimes if you come to church and you see that somebody near you is a distraction to you, and in this moment you are not able to show up that distraction, beg the usher, say, please, so that this day will not waste. Eh? So that this, so that's why sometimes, for example, there are some husband and wife that should not sit together in church. Because pastor is teaching. They will go home empty-handed. And the day of judgment will come. God will say, you, I told you. Amen. Amen. So if you are going to be sitting here, somebody that is, see that boy head. See that boy head. That person is not your friend. Definitely not your wife. And see, you should know that even if the person you are wedded to is telling you, know that this is not my wife. <laughs> Just the way Jesus was able to know this is not my Peter. And he said to him, Satan, get the be. Do you understand? This one is not my Peter. So you, you are a Satan speaking now. So if a person is sitting beside you consistently during the process of edification, it's always taking, look, even if you are focused on me, you are not hearing any, everything I'm saying. You go back to the tape, you wonder when it was said. Before you write and raise your head, something has been said again. Then imagine when somebody is not deliberately consistently taking your attention of what is being said is the person is an agent of the devil. Agent of the devil. 
husband or wife, bestie or not. All the BFFs should hear God's word together. Are you getting what I'm saying? When your BFF see you and your attention in church, he too will be adjusted. In case you don't know, that's why, listen, lead, especially leaders, pastors, ministers, and leaders, you teach the people by your example how to receive the word of God. And one of the ways is to give the word of God ample attention. You know, have you ever tried to talk to somebody whose attention was focused on something before and you knew to keep quiet? Has it happened to you before? You just look the guy. Not be now. Not be now. Bad timing. He not talk to you, but you know, say, nobody should be able to disturb you consistently in church. And by the way, I should also add, if somebody easily distracts you like that in church, it's your fault. You see my face? Me. Can you distract me in church? You cannot. <laughs> you can, I, I'm telling you, you cannot. One time, I wasn't married then. I followed my wife to Redeem Camp. You know, she was a youth pastor in Redeem. And it was a yeah, major, major meeting. So when I got there, first of all, there was no seat. But somehow, because my wife is a youth pastor, long story short, they got us a spot. But it was not too far from the front where Redeemers University students will sit. We sat there. In, I, that's where I sat, actually. In front. And some people were just fighting, dragging chairs. I mean, literally fighting. Elbow punches. I just these people don't even understand. Me, me, me. Don't worry. Once this Baba Adebo will come out, I will go and sit in front on the floor. Me. I will go that forward. I will see who is I will go there. Sit down on the floor. In front. No need to if I'm fighting for share. Share. I don't need share. I need I don't mean I don't need share. I will just go forward. They sit on the floor like this. And write. Because I know where this is. I know what this is. I know what is going on here. My life is being directed here. You must know what church is. When Jesus preached a hard message saying they must drink his blood and eat his flesh in John 6. And all who were with him left him and company with him no more. The Bible says he turned and looked at the twelve. Will you not go also? And they said, to whom shall we go? You only have the words of life. So when you come to church like this, there's a distribution of the word of life. There's a ministration to you of life. Life is being ministered. So he who is taking your attention when life is being ministered, what is the person to you? If I explain it now, in a, in a physical colloquial term, way that you understand it, you, you will know the implication of a person who distracts you in church. Somebody who is on life support machine in the hospital. You know life support machine. You are on drip, life support. Then imagine the person that comes constantly to be offering the socket. No, no, I've been wanting to tell you something. Uh, you know, say... You know, say, um, um, you know, but, um, arrest, uh, it may feel it now. Okay, okay. Test on life. Um, actually, what they are doing, they are just, they don't put your Obama now for the, for the uh, office. So they won't just put me to say Obama and did it. You know, if you check, we're going to be Muslim. This is a Muslim, Muslim, anything. So. Uh -huh. Make I tell you something. <laughs> Don't you know that person is about to kill you? Then as a guy, they call your palmer for truth. Look, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> and the Bible is clear. Proverbs says in chapter 4, he said, They are life to those who find them. The words of God, though. they are life to those who find them. Health to all their flesh. Health. So anybody who's taking away edification from you, he is your enemy. That's how you know your enemy. A life will go in the direction of your word. Amen. Amen. So do we have the amplified of Hebrews 5 and verse 7? Please let's go back. So Jesus prayed. The Bible says he was head in that he feared. He was heard in that he had a reverential submission. That's where I'm going. It says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up definite, specific petitions for that which he not only wanted but needed, and supplication with strong crying and tears to who, always, who was always able to save him out from death. Amen. Can I have my device? So that I'll be able to just get it quick. Okay. 
Thank you. So this, it says, and supplication with strong crying and tears to him who was always able to save him out of debt, and he was heard because of his reverence towards God, his whole his godly fear, his piety, in that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father. So here's a point I want to bring out. We said it before. This is just a recap. Jesus was a priest, an example for us to follow. And he knew that his primary responsibility as a priest was to offer up sacrifices. But very importantly, the Bible says he was head because he actually had that reverence. Reverential submission. If you have the NIV, you see that exact word. Reverential submission. So when we come to prayer, we are coming to submit. We said one of the mean of Father is that I'm not my own because Father means source and sustainer. The Father knows what I need. So as we are coming to God in prayer, we are taking a posture that says, Ah, not my will, but thine. As Jesus prayed in Matthew 26 and verse 42, he says, I wish that this cup would pass over me, but not my will, but thine. So we must learn something in prayer. Prayer is not that God, you must do this thing like this. Prayer is God, this thing is becoming a burden to me. And I cannot carry a burden. So take the body. Did you hear what I said? In Philippians 4 and verse 6, it says that you should be careful for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But take note where it begins. It says don't carry the body. So what do we do in prayer? We are not trying to force God to do certain things in certain ways. Because this is where the frustration is coming for many people. In prayer, we are coming to present that reverential submission to God. Of saying, not my will, but yours. So you see the subject of marriage. Instead of you to be going to God to say, God, give me that Isha man that works in the oil company like this and this time. What you are doing in prayer is that burden of marriage. You are taking it to God and you are dropping it before the Lord. And listen to this. God's response first is to give you peace on that subject. Then he will go right ahead to do it the way he wants to do it. So, in this example that I just gave, it's not each a man that you need. It's husband that you need. Did you hear what I said? It's not Igbo girl that you need. It's wife. That God has designed to fulfill ministry with you. Amen? Amen? So, when we come to God like this, in prayer, please note this. God makes a demand of you when you pray. God always makes a demand of righteousness, righteous living now, a changed behavior when you pray. In case you don't know, please, I want to make it very simple this morning. God has only one aim in your life. And it was his original aim from the beginning to conform you to the image of the Son. From the beginning, remember what he said. Let us make man in our own image and likeness. Now you must understand this, that everything that God is doing in your life is to actually forge the image of the Son in you. Even in maturing you inside the church, it says he has given those gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry so that the body will be what? Edified. He says he did this thing till we all come to the unity of the faith, which is the knowledge of the Son. So we'll come to that full measure of the stature of the image of Christ. So what is it? Everything God is doing is to change you to become like Jesus. 
everything God does. Church membership, service unit in church, everything that God does. Discipleship class is to change you to the image of Jesus. When you pray, like everything else that he does, like everything else he said you should do, fasting, giving, everything God does has one aim. And what is that aim? To conform you to the image of the Son. So that you will be more like Jesus. That's why he does anything. So in case you don't know this, please learn it. The first use of prayer is to change you to Jesus. The first use of prayer is to change you to be more like the Son. No one is successful in praying that is not changed by prayer. So prayer is supposed to transform you. Make you more like Jesus the Savior. So listen to me. If you are praying and you are not changing, first things first, you are not praying. What you are doing is that you are declaring your lust. Your lustful desires. Lust, yes, not you trying to have sex with a person. No. Lust is the excessive desire, want of a thing. You stay with it. It says, when you do ask, you do not receive because you were asking amiss. You were asking to consume it on your own lust. Any prayer that's not changing you, take note, it's not prayer. You are going to God and you are just wrapping your lust. I want this. I want that. I want this, this time. I want that this time. I want this, this man. I have it now. God is not in short supply of anything you want. God is not in short supply of anything you need. What God wants to do is not give you things. It's to make you someone. And that person is Jesus Christ. What God really wants to do is to make you Jesus Christ. So, prayer is supposed to make you more patient. Because in prayer, you learn to wait on God. You learn to not change your character while the time passes. So patience is not a passage of time. Pa patience is a constancy of attitude while time passes. Did you hear what I said? If you are passive during time or during the passage of time, you are not patient. Because the mean of patience is constancy. I don't change in behavior. I don't change in speech. I don't change in fervency. For example, if your fervency in the things of God has dropped, you are not a patient person. No matter what happened to you. Hey, they did this thing to you in church. They said this thing to you. That's why you are not fervent with church again. Oh God, you are not constant. You are not like God. You are not operating in the image of the sword. That's what it means. Simple. So in prayer, as it changes you, you are becoming more and more dependent on the Father. Prayer is that you are rendering and announcing your submission to the Father. That's why Jesus said, not as I will, but as you will. Let that be done. Let it be what is done. Not as I will. And the pattern of Jesus is a pattern for all. So in prayer, you go and say, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As it is in heaven, let it be done. So remember I said this. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The next thing is, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. So prayer is not about the establishment of your kingdom. Prayer is not about getting your will done. Prayer is about getting the will of the Father done. Prayer is about establishing and enforcing the kingdom of God. I want, I want, let me announce it to you. Everyone raise your hand and hear me clear. You cannot be trusted. Did you hear what I said? You cannot trust you. You can't trust you with your own life. Too many times you are vindictive. Too many times you are vengeful. Too many times you are envious. Too many times you are jealous. If God gives you all the things you want, all the time, you know what you have done? 
You have wished someone dead before you that is here. You have just wished that that guy who took your money and ran away, as he was going, that one car would just hit him. It's a trailer that would jam and crush him. You have had that wish before. Amen. Amen. So imagine God gives all of us all the wishes and wants and desires of our hearts. Huh? What will happen? People have gone to God who are angry. Some people are angry with God that God has not punished some people. Some people in this church are angry with God that God has not punished some other people in this church. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's not your will. Prayer is not about your will. It says, thy will be what? Done. The problem that is leading to frustration now is you are trying to enforce your will. You know, one time I told a lady in this church that <laughs> where you are, I can't trust you to make a decision of who you will marry. Hey, are you saying, I, I'm saying simple. The way you day now is like this. Even you will regret your decision in a few months. Do you not know that there are many states people are in that they can't make the right decision for themselves? You don't know that. And that season you'll be praying. You, in that season you'll be praying, God, this is my husband. God, this is my God, they look you like. This is always in the verse for the former boy. They say, This is my husband. Now the verse in the prayer, expressing the verse in prayer. Are, are you seeing him now? Do you understand what I mean? That you cannot be trusted with you. The man's ways is not in himself. You hear me? You see, you cannot be trusted with you. That's why we yield to the unknowing God. That's why we yield to the one who have called the end from the beginning. It is his will. Oh. The, wisest thing to, the wisest way to live your life is in submission to God. Did you hear what I said? The wisest way to live your life is in submission to God. Because you cannot be trusted. The Bible makes it clear. So in prayer, we are going to put off the old nation. As Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24 says to us. In prayer, we are going to put on the new nature. The more we are changed... The more trusted our prayers can be. Look up, everyone, please. Look up. Excuse me. Look at me. Good. Good. Uh, Uno, please, get up. Walk around. Anybody that is sleeping, get a big wood. <laughs> Don't be your own enemy. Amen? Amen? So the more you are changed to the image of Christ, the better you can pray for yourself. Until you are changed. Oh boy. You don't know what you are praying for. I'm telling you. You don't know what you are praying for. But then if your son says to you. If Zion says to you. Daddy give me a car. If you are really my father. If you are really my father and you love me. Give me a car and the car, and the car keys. Let me drive. Do you love him? Yes. Why will you give him a car and car key at that age? Are you getting the idea? So, sometimes you are praying. It's not a prayer. It's a declaration of your lust. Are you getting the idea? It is only a prayer if it is the will of God. It is only a prayer if it is the will of God. All this, I want by this time. I want by... Uh, uh. When ye fasted and prayed and mourned all these 70 years, were ye fasting and praying to me? The moment you pray my petition and say you said, you reveal to me, hey, I will not show up. Hey, that was not a prayer. Do you understand it? It means a lot of things that people are calling prayer that is not what? Prayer. So prayer is not a way you... Get God to do what you want. Prayer is a way you become an instrument to God to do what God wants. As it is done in the heavens, so it will be done on the earth. By who? 
So when you go to God in prayer, you are going to God yielding yourself as a vessel of the will of God. You are going to God to say, use me to do what you want to do, not what I want. And I also say this, no matter how lofty your desires are, your prayers will always sustain you. Your prayers are never sufficient for your needs. Hey, did you hear me? What God wants to do, eyes have not seen it. Ears have not heard it. It has not come to the imagination of men. Anything you are praying for, everybody here, write the top three things you want to pray for now. You are going to be praying for something that you have seen. At best, you will be praying with something that you have seen in mind. God, give me a house that is bigger than Benjamin's house. But you saw Benjamin's house. In comparison with Benjamin's house. Do you get it now? But the Bible makes it clear that what God wants to do for you, even Benjamin, I've not seen it. He said, neither has he come into the heart of a man. Because if you ask Adam in the Garden of Eden what he wanted, there's no way Adam would have written a wife. There's no way Adam would have put wife. Has he seen wife before? Does he know wife? Absolutely no way. So you cannot even trust your mind in that prayer. Anything you are praying for, you must understand God has bigger and better for you. Ephesians 3.20 is clear. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or see. More than we can ask or. So when we go to God, we are submitting. We are submitting. Please hear this. God's ability to answer your prayer goes beyond anything you can ask. Goes beyond anything you can imagine. It's just the way he is. He does everything in superfluous ways. He does everything he wants to do in excess. So you, when you go to God in prayer, one of the things you are saying is that I don't exactly know what I need. But this is what I think is going on. Oh, did you hear me? Did you hear me? You trust God with your life in prayer. But if you limit God in your own life, you won't see it. Everyone say, not my will, but thine. thine. Say, not my will, but thine. thine. We began to see that you must approach God as rightly. And the way to approach God is as a righteous man. Because only righteous men can approach God. However, we said there are three types of righteousness. The righteousness of the law, the righteousness of works, and the righteousness of God. And only the righteousness of God is qualified to approach God. However, we noted that a lot of believers are operating in the righteousness of works. And we said that anything you do, any good thing you do, To make God hear you more is a sin. Any good thing you do to make God hear you more, you have sinned. If you fast so that God will hear you, you sinned. If you give so that God will hear you, you sinned. If you stop stealing so that God will hear you, you also sinned. If you stop drinking and smoking this week, there are some people who want to pray. But they know that they are, are not clean. So in the next two, three weeks, I could just abstain. No going out. No, no fornicating. No, not touch me. So when they don't pure two, three weeks, hey, God will hear me now. Any good thing you do so that God will hear you is a sin. Why is it a sin? You are diluting the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the only ground upon which God will hear you. Are you all hearing this? So you cannot add to it. You cannot take from it. Leave it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. A lot of times, we do certain good Christian practices on the wrong premise. 
thinking that it will make God. See, there is absolutely nothing you can do to make God hear you. God desires to hear you. It is his will to hear you. You can't make him hear you. Are you all listening to this? You can't, look, you cannot give to God so that God will hear you. What does that make him? A poor God. A God that can be bribed. It is not your seed that made God hear you. It is a lie. When people teach it, what does that mean? The rich will always get better from God. True or false? Are you the richest in this city, people sitting here? Does God not answer your prayer? What do you mean? Thieves can give more. I hope you know that. Thieves can give more. Would that make God hear them more than you? No. The blood of Jesus is a leveling ground. Giving everybody equal opportunity to be heard by God. Oh, are you guys hearing what I'm saying? God hears you. God hears you. God hears you. Now, these three men I pointed are from different backgrounds. Right now, their band balance are different. Oh, did you hear me? They are from three different tribes. But listen, all those things don't count. The only thing that will make God hear them is that they put their faith in the blood of Jesus. I'm praying in the name of what? Jesus. So if you need something from God, and then you put, you sow a seed because of that thing, you are sinning. Amen? Oh, there's a lot of corrections there. You do hear what I'm saying? So does it mean you should not sow seed? Sow seeds, but know why you are sowing seeds. Know why. You see, the best way not to sleep, madam, is to raise your head. When you drop your head, you will sleep. Stay with me. You can't hear me like that. Know why you are what? Sowing seed. One of the first reasons you sow seed is to make sure that you announce it, that my trust is not in this thing. I'm not looking to money. If you cannot give money, your trust is in money. That's why 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, that they do not put their trust in uncertain riches, but that they put their trust, their confidence in the living God who gives us richly all things to... Then it goes on in verse 18 to show you how do you know, how can you prove that your trust is in God? He said that they do good. That they do good. How do you know your trust is in God? You do good. How do you prove to God that your trust is in him? You are rich in good works. You are ready to distribute. You are willing to communicate. If you are not willing to give, your trust is not in God. It's in what you have. However little it is. That's why there are more poor people whose trust is in money than rich people. When the, rich, rich, the poor man says, I know what I will do when I have that trust in riches. Anytime you say, I know what I will do when I have, that's you displaying that God is not your trust. God is not the anchor of your life. Because for us on the other side, we can do anything through Christ that strengthens us, not true when we have. It is a form of idolatry, as in you will become an idol worshiper anytime you say, I know that I will be able to do this when I have this. No, I do what is necessary because I'm sufficiently supplied for through Christ. Do you understand it? Look, when we do things in this church, we never do them because we have the money. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you, when, we move, when we're about to move to this place, we didn't even have the agency money. But God said, this is the place. This is the place. We are going there. If God said, this is the place, we will be able to do it through him who will supply it. Are you getting what I'm saying? If you consistently calculate your life, I told you, I don't never, 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 I've learned never to read my menu from the right. Never. God says, this is what I want, he wants me to do. Oh boy, it means God has put money somewhere. Did you hear me? In the mouth of a fish, he has put money somewhere. He has commanded a man from the east to come. He has put money somewhere. 
So every time you begin to think that I will be able to, no, 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 no. I will be able as God supplies. I will be able as God instructs. If God says go, I go. Because I know he already has it somewhere. So if God says go, I'm going because I know on the way he will send his supply. Did you hear what I said? So your willingness to give is a display of who you trust. Because you know, some of you know that if I spend this one now, you don't know who knows tomorrow. If something happens now, we not go feed the, you know, you are calculating. You are cal- your head, now you need to calculate your life. Your small head. You are calculating. If we, if we, oh, God is my trust. God is my trust. God is my trust. That's why Moses was able to say, he said, the Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. God is my trust. God is my trust. God is my trust. God is my trust. Oh, the safest way to protect your future eh, is to invest in God. It's not to keep money anywhere else. Save wisely as God instructs you to, as God guides you to. But listen to me. The safest way to preserve your future. Hey, hey, hey. I will tell you guys some things in this church. See, there are times when people are in the world, people want to hide and keep what they have. And God is saying, give more. Sell things and give out. Sell things and give. <laughs> are you all listening to this this morning? Anybody who feels confident to approach God because of anything they have done is not coming to God on the righteousness of God in Christ. And God is not in that place. Why? We only approach God because we believe in the gospel. You know, for example, Romans 1, 16, Paul speaking said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For therein, where? The gospel. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. So when we go to God in prayer, we are praying in faith. Elder James said, let him ask in faith. Let him not ask thinking he has something. Let him not ask thinking he knows someone. Because some of you, your prayer even is not for God to supply for you. It's for God to touch your brother or your uncle to give you. That's not a prayer. Listen to me. Any form of prayer that you come to God to say, God, touch this my uncle to do and so, so, and so. Listen to me. That is divination. Did you hear me? It's not prayer. It is witchcraft. You are trying to manipulate somebody. It's witchcraft. And that's what many people are doing. Amen? Amen. So you don't fast so that you can pray. So that means qualified for. Fasting does not qualify you for prayer. The only thing that qualifies us for prayer is the blood of Jesus. That has been shared. You don't have to share it again. Does this mean you should not fast? Dear leftists, you must know why you fast. Fasting is to consecrate yourself so that you can be concentrated on the word of God. So fasting is not about getting your God's attention. Fasting is about getting your own attention. Did you hear me? Fasting is not to get the attention of God. Fasting is to get your own attention. Fasting is to get you from anything that is distracting you so that God can speak to you. Fasting is to clear your ear of all the debts in your ear so that when God speaks, you will hear. Fasting is to remove every dead breeze of sin inside of you so that you can receive from God. Oh, please listen to me. The reason why many cannot get from God is because their heart is polluted. Their heart is bad. It's not because God is not speaking. One of the reasons why most of the prophecies concerning the election was bad is because the people speaking themselves are already partisan. They are already one-sided. Did you hear what I said? That heart, such a heart cannot bring the counsel of God. Such a person... Some of them will hear God. But you see, your prophecy is as accurate as the state of your heart. That's why anywhere there's a spirit of fear, nobody will hear God clearly. They will speak through fear. So what do you do when you fast? You incline your ear. 
I remember using Yinka. Where's my friend Yinka on, on, on Friday? With fasting, you are saying, Yinka, you answer yes. Yinka, you say yes. Yinka, only you will say yes. Then you ask Yinka, how many times did I hear you? Call you, say three times. He said, listen to God. That's what you are doing in fasting. Calling yourself to attention so that you can be inclined. Are you here? So you don't need to be hungry for God to hear you. Please take note. No, you don't. But you need to be consecrated, separated to hear God. So fasting is about you more than it's about God. Jesus is the only reason we are approaching. Hebrews 10, 20 says, by a new and living way, we are now, which, which he has consecrated us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So we come to him based on the fact that Jesus has qualified us to come to him. Amen? Amen? When we give, one of the things we are saying is that we are giving because our confidence is not in what we own. Our confidence is in you. Praise the Lord. That's one of the reasons we give. So in giving, I think in teaching this series, I will touch giving here and there because there's a concept of seed faith that has been abused. There, there are two reasons to give to a man of God. Number one, simple, he's a man of God. That's not deep. He's a true man of God. Give to him. Amen. That's it. As simple as that. So when we begin to add, when well, you give to this, you will do the this. No, it's deception. The second reason to give to a man of God is that God has used his ministry to edify you, to bless you. Do you understand that? Put Galatians 6 and verses up there. If you understand it, if those who, for example, the Bible makes it clear. It says those who have labored in the world over you, Huh? He says, know them, which is honor them. Give them double honor. That is, give them your material substance. Galatians 6, he says, let him that is taught in the world communicate unto him that teacheth. Are you getting the idea? All good things. The problem with people from around here is, many people don't want to be instructed in the truth, so the preachers will find a deceptive way to do it. To get from them. No. Every, every bona fide healthy church member who is being edified in a local assembly by the ministry of a particular man, they are supposed to be given to the man naturally. You are supposed to have your pastor's account number naturally. And periodically you say, ah, God bless you for, giving, for being the vessel through whom God has been giving me the words of life. Simple. Amen. If I come to you and say to you that when you give me, God will hear you more, it's a lie. Did you hear what I said? It's a big, fat lie. So give, but know why you are giving. For example, we are building a church. And now pastor said we need at least six trips of sand this week. And all that. Oh boy, listen. If I say to you, if you give six trips, you have six blessings. And six angels will be released to you six times for six weeks. <laughs> listen, all those is a lie. Responsible sons rise up to build the house of God. Sons in the house who have been raised rise up to build a place for the edification of other saints. Amen. Amen. And God has his own reward for their obedience. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? Don't even come and say, God, I'm building your house because I'm building your house now. Because I'm building your house now. You are going to, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing will happen to you. Give in simple obedience. And God, as God, he will reward you the way he designed to what? Reward you. Don't go to God and say, we were the ones who built that church. That church in so and so place, we built it with our sweat and our blood. Lord, yes. Any good thing you do to make God hear you, to make God hear you, take note, is a what? Is a sin. You can't make God hear you. Are you all listening to what I'm saying? 
this is important because the way we approach, that is the way we enter, is a big deal as to whether we are praying or not. Can we read that scripture we read on, on, on Friday? Let's read it. Luke 18, uh, verse 9. I'll read the King James. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, which means they trusted in the works that they did, in that they thought they were righteous and despised others. Two men, he said, went into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed to us with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Or I'm not even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off in reverence and fear would not lift, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto the heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He said, Jesus speaking now, say, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than that Pharisee who was boastful of his good works. He says, for everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. You know, the Bible says, God resisted the proud. And he, God, gave grace to the humble. So when we go to God in prayer, we come humble. Don't go and tell God anything you have done. Last week, last week, he did not see my seed. Let me tell you something. Last week, God did not see your seed. The church saw your seed. What God saw, if you actually gave that seed from a heart that is good, God now saw the state of your heart, turned towards him. So God now saw that you trust him with your life. That's what God will see. It's not your seed. He does not need your money to furnish heaven. The running cost of heaven does not need your seed. You know, they hear me. So when you, gave, when you give that seed that will cost you something, no, I will not give the Lord that which cost me. When you give that seed that costs you something, take note of what is a seed to God. The condition of your heart when you give the seed. Are, are you getting the idea? So no, no, God did not see that your two million that dropped in church account last week. Do you understand? What God saw is that when you dropped your two million inside the church account, and God now saw the balance, and now know that although this guy really, really believed in money before, he was able to do this. Now his eyes are turned towards me. God says his attention is on me. His focus is on me. His trust is me. That's what God sees. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God is not going to tell you, get back to quickly withdraw that two million. <laughs> quickly withdraw the two million so that they can just, you know. Are you all listening to what I'm saying? Did you hear me? Yes, Say, uh, get back quick, oh, quick, before I change your mind, collect that two million so that uh, that street of gold made a polish that gold. Are you getting the idea? The heaven will go. Maybe it's your seed that they are using to build it. Say, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, bro. Collect that guy. That 500 case, he just come. Maybe they pack two, um, two tons of 20 carat gold. No, it's not gold until they build heaven, according to some people. Man, <laughs> the street paved on gold. Maybe they pack 20, uh, two tons there, two trips of gold. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, 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 more they build heaven for now. So, Amen. Your seeds do not turn the ear of God. That will make God partial. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? Approach him rightly. But you see, in this teaching, why I'm going back all this reiteration? It's balanced, so. Are you getting me? You say, Pastor, say fasting does not make God hear you. It's true. Fasting makes you hear God. So you need to what? Fast. Giving does not make God hear you. Giving displays your trust. Because where a man's treasure is, that's where his what? That will be. Giving displays your trust in God. 
giving puts your attention on God. Are you all getting the balance? So we're talking about the same spiritual disciplines, but I'm showing you the right perspective of why they should be done. If you can't serve, you can't say, God, use me. You can't say, give me the treasures of the kingdom. Just know it. Just know it. So in fasting, we incline our ear. And we said fasting is very clear. What fasting is? The first thing that happens in fasting is not that we don't eat. Please, listen. We are going to fast as a church now from the 15th. It is not that we don't eat. The first thing that happens in fasting is that we turn our backs to wicked and sinful behaviors. Is that you let go of every malice. How many people you know they talk to now? The least don't reach 50 something. You know, you know they pass some area for your street because are you getting the idea? How many people have you blocked on your WhatsApp? 322? How many people are on block on your WhatsApp? Isaiah 58 and verse 6. Is not this the first hour I have chosen? That you should lose the band of wickedness to undo the heavy body, to let the oppressed go free, and that every yoke be broken. So God says, the first that I, God, chose is that stop doing wicked things. Stop being generous. Start helping people. He goes on, to put it verse 7, verse 8, you see it. Start being good to people. That is fasting. Any form of blockade in your heart. You see, take note, the ultimate is that God should hear you. And what I'm telling you today is that malice, I mean, the ultimate rather is for you to hear God. Please, take notes. The ultimate is for you to hear God. And what I'm telling you is this. Malice blocks the condition of your heart. Envy blocks the condition of your heart. Are you seeing it now? Jealousy blocks the condition of your heart. Are you getting the idea now? Covetousness blocks the condition of your heart. All these things blocks you from hearing. And God says the first way to fast is to be a free man. Is to be a man that is not heard by anybody of this world. So and the second way to fast is that you pay attention to my word. So fasting is a time where you even go to the pastors and ask them, do we have any teaching on this subject? They say yes. So on the Mishra channel, this is the link. And then you feed on the word. So you don't while away time when you fast. Don't just wait for the prayer watches. 12 o'clock. <laughs> 3 o'clock. <laughs> 2 down. 2 two down. 2 of 3. 2 of 3. 2 of 3. Then you watch one long thing. You sleep, wake, sleep, wake. If you do those things, you have not fasted. Fasting is incline your ears to me. Turn your ears to me. So what do you do when you fast? You binge on the world. You hear me? You binge on the word. Take time to begin to meditate on the teachings. Go back to the words that pastor said. Meditate on them. Read the Bible. That's what it means to fast. Hallelujah. Are you still here? Are you still here? And one of the things I said to you on Friday is, the fear of other God is disbelief in God. The fear of other gods is what? I want us to say it. Chorus it. One, two, three, go. Some of you are afraid to go to your village. Now lie, now fear. When they, some of you cannot do your traditional marriage in the village. You they fear. It's a big deal to God. Say, thou shalt have no other God but me. We are, many believers have God and then there's small, small God. Small, small God are you afraid of? The fear of other God is what? A father was going, I was explaining this to someone. Right? This example came to me from God. Right? Fumi, you are Mike Tyson's sister. You know who Mike Tyson is? You are Mike Tyson's sister. And Mike Tyson said that you should pass drive through Fanny Coyote 
and meet me at a Jebba Junction. Mike Tyson is waiting for you at a Jebba Junction. Eh? Then one of the Coco youth tell you not to pass Fanica your day. Then you don't pass Fanica your day. Do you guys understand the illustration? So what happens? She is more afraid of a very good youth than Mike Tyson. Somebody like Mike Tyson will use one punch. <laughs> one punch. If, my, if Mike Tyson punches him once, his children that he has not given birth to, they will feel it. Oh, did you hear what I said? So you don't, when you go to the village, you know, they drink mineral and I say they give us a wish, so now they drink, drink, now they drink, now they drink, now you are afraid. And God said, you need to look. Why, why are we so, we are more afraid of the devil than we are afraid of God. Just say that I your colleague now, bony man. Now pass down, not sit down for the chair. You don't need to drop it for the chair. Oh, God, I need that chair. Bring it here. You and the man that did the thing for you in your body, all of you will be saved. They should be more afraid of you. In this example now, Mike Tyson's sister is supposed to do clear road. Do you understand me? That boy go go is not go to shout. Clear road, clear road. But you are afraid of them. Not if you go village, oh. The last person we go village for now has. You know the story, I am declaring faith in God. Praise the Lord. Are you still here? Are you still here? So we go to God on the basis that God loves you. Let it sink in. Let it stay with you. Let it settle in your heart. So we are not going to him on any other reason other than the cross. We are not going to him on the basis of our seed. We are not going to him on the basis of our works. We are not going to him on the basis of our goodness. You see, that Pharisee said, I'm not an adulterer. Did you hear it? Did you, did you not see it in the Bible? He said, I'm not like this guy. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Doesn't make God hear you. Does it mean you should drink and smoke now? Oh boy, now. Thank God, say, Pastor, say, none of all these things make God hear me now. Oh boy, oh. Ah, the blood of Jesus. I believe the blood now. The blood, believe me. <laughs> blood, you don't believe me. <laughs> so you ask the blood, the blood of Jesus, you don't believe me. <laughs> It is lack of faith in the blood when we live recklessly. Because the blood did not, us, did not only make us right with God, it also gave us power to live right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is true. Not, no work of goodness you do will make God hear you. It does not mean you should now not do goodness. Praise God. Praise God. So we go to God based on what? What Jesus has done. Based on the blood of Jesus. We go to God knowing that he loves us. He's waiting to embrace us. He's waiting to hear from us. Matthew 21, 22. He said, whatever we ask in prayer, you will receive. If you have faith. Faith in what? Jesus. James 1, 6. He said, let him ask in faith. Faith in what again? Jesus. Jesus, John 14, 14. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Don't ask in your goodness. Don't ask in your faithfulness. The Bible says, if God were to count sin, no man will stand. I know so you're not lying. Last week told you the best of your knowledge. Did you hear what I said? To the best of your knowledge. Because if God open your account, that's why he does not have account. He said it keeps no record of sin. Just hear it. Hear it. Look for that place in the Psalms. If God were to count sin, 
You know what it means? There is none. Even Jesus said, he said, there's none good but God. Do you know that's what Jesus said? He said, there's none good but God. Jesus said, look, he said, if I, brother, <laughs> if God open your account today, and God will not open your account. <laughs> because God has no account. He said, if, if God were to count sin, all flood, all will be in hell. All. So that some of us will still be with him in heaven. You say, okay, I will not count sin. So there's no way you can go to God in the first place saying, I got this. I got this. Are you getting the idea? He said, I got this. You got nothing but mercy. Say, I have mercy. He say, I have mercy. And that's the reason we approach. That's why we come. Ephesians 3.12. You know, the third man who told Jesus, he said, from an early age, he has kept all ten commandments. Just look and say, really? So okay. He said, sell everything you have and give to the poor and follow me. You know the guy not reply Jesus? Go and read your Bible. He did not reply Jesus. Jesus said, sell everything you have and give to the poor, then follow me. He didn't reply Jesus. So. The Bible says he left there heavy with sorrow for he had much possession. So when Jesus said, sell everything you have and give to the poor, the guy just turned. His sorrow was palpable. <laughs> and he, he just left. He just left. So while he was keeping all ten commandments, his trust was in what he had. Did you see that? So Jesus knew where to pinch him. Jesus knew where he says, sell. So you can't go to God and say, I got this. That's what that guy did though. He told Jesus, I got this. I've kept all ten commandments from my youth. And Jesus just looked at him and said, ah, really? Really? Some of you, they say, sell your car. Now, if you stop this church, I'm telling you, if one day God just, and God can do it. Let me tell you, God can do it. Look at me. God can do it. God can do it. Or it can do it as a one-off instruction. The only problem is when we not make it a doctrine. God can say every member of this church, all you're aiming for the next one month, give it. The problem is some people are here and they don't shake. Charge them that have something in this world. <laughs> that they be not high minded or put their trust in uncertain God can actually what? Do it. And sometimes, let me teach you something. Let me just teach you something. Even without it being instructed from the altar, periodically, you check where your trust is. Did you hear what I said? Periodically, oh. You check where your trust is. And how did he say you should do it in 1 Timothy 6? Give. Give all. And sit down and say, I watch God supply. I will watch God provide. Amen. Amen. Because, see, let me tell you the truth. Covetousness does not come at once. It comes in trickles. And one day you realize. And that realize is in the mercy of God that will help you realize. Because now, eh? Your word is on your phone now. With your phone, you can do things. With your phone, you can change the world. With your phone. Some of us, our trust is in our contact. We know people. We know people. Nobody will oppress you. And when you say nobody will oppress you, you know they look up, you know they look God. Oh. It's not he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. Like Psalm 91. No. Your own be say. Anybody see any uh, boys go there on site. You don't know no boys. Boys go there on site just now, just now, just now. Who do any uh, go see? Before you scroll your phone, two call, two call now go make. Now two phone call, every, every, every go scatter. <laughs> Who is? Praise God. So periodically show to yourself that God is my word. Trust. God is my trust. God is my trust. 
God is my trust. Ephesians 3 and verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. We have what? Boldness. So, I will take time to explain this on Wednesday. Huh? But let me tell you guys this. Anything that you did that is making the volume of your prayer to reduce is an expression of unbelief in the blood of Jesus. Because the volume of your prayer, invariably the confidence in your prayer, the boldness of your prayer wasn't tied to your action in the first place. Can you read only the first line for me, everybody? One, two, three, go. No, 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 just stay there now. First line. I said that's what they say for school. Please, read it out. One, two, three, go. In whom we have boldness. So our boldness in prayer is not in ourselves. It's in someone. Did you hear me? In whom we have what? Can we call us this as a church? One, two, three, go. You know why God chose not to put your boldness in you, Cassandra? Sometimes your mood they swing. Abby? Sometimes you they feel one kind, true of us. I don't say you believe yourself. So some of us we believe no, I worry, guys. I believe myself, die. Well, how many people here who believe they self die? They, when they call they leave, sometimes, so once in a while, you they doubt yourself. Man, see, you're truthful now, be truthful. Once in a while, you say, I shall say, I'll be. Philip, it happened to you before. God knows. Now, periodically, eh, sometimes, even you, they doubt your big dream. Abby? So sometimes you doubt you. In those periods when you are in doubt, you will not have boldness. So he decided to store your boldness, not in you, but in someone who is consistent. He stored your boldness in something that is already perfected. The cross is perfect. It's a done deal. Do you understand that? And there is a bank of boldness for you on the cross. And any time you need to be bold, you don't need to look at your account. You don't need to look at who you know. You know one of the reasons why people join Kofra is for boldness. So that you go get men. Once you get your men, you can always be bold. But those of us who are in the kingdom, we know. How many of you know that they that be for us are more than they that be for them? Do you understand that? And because of that, we are just bold. Why are we bold? The cross. Why am I bold? The cross. Why will I have boldness tomorrow? The cross. Why will I have boldness next year? The cross. That's why that song, old song is correct. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Of fear. Sing it out, sing it out. He holds my future. My life is what? Let's do it one more time with intent. Because he lives. Because I can face. Because he lives. All fear is gone. Because I know. My life. So guess what? When you come and take a posture of prayer, and then there is something that is pressing your shoulder, pressing your mind, saying to you, you are not qualified, you are not rich. You are, that thing is actually saying, it, it has more efficacy than the blood of Jesus. In whom we have what? Boldness. So what does that mean? 
anytime, anywhere. I say anytime, anywhere. I can speak to God boldly. Oh, did you hear what I said? All I need to do is check the boldness bank, which is the cross. Is there see some boldness there in the cross? There will always be boldness in the cross. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So I check. There's boldness. What do I do? I say, Father! What I'm teaching you this morning, you know, I only just got into the message, so I'll do introduction. On Wednesday, we'll teach it. What I'm saying to you is this. At any given point in time, any time T, any place P, Tobore David is bold B. Do you understand it? Sometimes you want to pray. It's just this thing, thoughts pressing you down. Have you felt it before? Yes, you are not good enough. Is it not you that reminding you of your inadequacies? The cross is always adequate to call God Father. It's the cross that is calling Father through me. Oh, I, I be speaker. Oh, are you all hearing what I'm saying? You can always say, Father, let's try with boldness. Father. Hey, anything trying to keep you from being bold in prayer is trying to keep you from help. Okay, it's true now. I stole last week, it's true. But he's the one that can help me to stop stealing. Did you hear what I said? Nothing should keep you from your help. Let's shout one more time. Say, Father! Father! In him we have what? Boldness. It's boldness. What is this boldness? Confidence to enter. That's what it means. I will go into details on Wednesday, but this is what? Confidence to what? Enter. Have you, ever, have you ever been to a place before? A place is so fine, so too, so grand, so noble. And somehow at the door, you question whether or not you should enter. Has it happened to you before? It has happened to me a few times. It has happened to me. As some places you go to, you can't check yourself. And this dress, no. Uh, in 2011, I wore my best clothes somewhere, but it still looked like rag when I saw the people in the place. My best clothes, my best clothes, just buy and fresh. But when I saw everybody else in the place, hi, hi, may the give me three might save them. You want some juice? <laughs> yes, your chicken, sir. <laughs> Amen. It's also something to teach you that no matter where you think you are, that is your zenith and your, your roof now, eh? there are places you will enter that people you will see, you will know that your roof is someone's floor. And if you are aware, so you, do you understand that? Some of the things you have now, you prayed for them five, ten years ago, true or false? But you still don't have enough. Yes. What do you get? That's why none of those things is a qualification. Only the blood is a what? It's a qualification. Don't even let the devil remind you of the good that you have not done that you are supposed to do. You have not given your partnership now three months. You won't call God. Which God? Who be your father? Bastard, give me. He said, who be your father? Pastor, come over there. He, ne he never does that. There's always boldness for me. I can always be bold. I can, by the cross, I'm bold. By the cross, I'm bold. I can enter. You know what it means? If they say God is there, there, God is there. There are no bodyguards that can keep me from there. I can enter that place. Confidently, I can just go. Why? He's my father. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? He is my what? Father. I can enter that place. I can enter that place. So why does the devil have the room to begin to make you feel unqualified in prayer? It's because Many of us do not have the understanding of what qualified you to pray in the first place. You know, when we were growing up, 
you must have English and mass in Waek. How many of you know that thing? English and what? No, no, English and mass. Some of you still don't have English and mass. We'll check you. <laughs> anyway, you have to have English and mass for to enter school. That's the first. Just it's just a prerequisite. So imagine that, and then you need five credits. How many of you know this thing I'm talking about? You need what? Five credits to enter school. That's the qualification. Mass, English, and three other relevant course, uh, subjects. Imagine you now go for the interview. Somebody is telling, and you have mass and English and three other credits. Somebody is now telling you that what they are looking for is height. The only people who are seven feet tall can actually enter full prey. And then you believed. Then you did not go to school. You are at home for six years. Say, Peter, why you never go to school? Say, I'm not seven feet. You're not seven feet. Say, eh. Who told you you need to be seven feet? That's what he said, though. And all along, five credit days. How would you feel? All along, five credits a day house. It's because many believers did not know the qualification in the first place. That's why the devil lied to them that they were not qualified. Inside Jesus, you have your five credits. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? The devil can make you think many things. The devil can even tell you people from your tribe not to really blow like that. Check your village. Anybody don't be big man for your village. The devil can make you think what, what do you think Jabez and Jephthah, what do you think they were saying? Uh, Gideon, what do you think they were saying? They were saying that their village is not qualified to see the move of God. The smallest house of the smallest tribe of the smallest, what is he saying? The devil does that to believers today. So if you don't know the right qualification, you'll be disqualified for the wrong qualification. Why? Ignorance. Imagine somebody telling you, you are not up to six feet, that's why we will not give you university admission. When all you need is maths and English and three other subjects. What does this do for you today? Nothing can stop me from praying. No obedience or disobedience can stop me from what? Praying. At any given point in time, I can always say what? Father! That's what we're saying. Anytime, anywhere. The conditions do not have to be what? Perfect. The cross is the condition. And the condition has been met. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? So the reason why prayer is a short sometimes during the week is because many of us don't know the qualification. Say, I can enter. Oh, come on. Say, I can enter. Say, I can enter. And I will stress it a little more with scriptures later. I can enter every time. In those days, the priest, the chief priest really, entered the holies of holies once a year. Only once, oh. Only once a year. That's when the chief priest will enter. And they will tie a lot of things on his body. But guess what? I can enter where? By the, side, by the roadside, I just say, Father, I say, yes, my son. Inside toilet, I say, Father, I say, yes, my son. Inside plane, I say, Father, I say, yes, my son. So, there's something I'm trying to achieve. A confidence to pray. Do you hear what I'm saying? A boldness to call God. There are things we teach for the maturing of the believer. Get into discipleship group. So that you'll be fit for God to use you. Serve. So that God will purify your character. And make you more fit to be used. Give. So that your attention will be on God. All those things are good things. But can I tell you something? 
Not to encourage a bad behavior, but to tell you the truth. If you have not come to church in the last one month, you can still say what? If your pastor does not like you, you can still say what? Father. If pastor has not replied your message, your WhatsApp message for two months, you can still say what? Father. Are you getting the idea? The pastor cannot disqualify you from calling God Father. Now he died for cross. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? Say, pastor scolded me last week. I don't really think, God will be really angry with me. I don't really think I can pray. Say, Father. Father. But you see, like I said, all those things are for balance. Huh? Did you hear me? You can say, Father, anytime, anywhere, with any condition. But God cannot use you anywhere. God cannot use you with any condition. God cannot use you. Are you are getting me? So those things are important. Say Father one more time. Father. Say Father again. Father. Say Father again. Father. So one thing you have is this. You have full access to God. In God's house, you can enter any room. In God's house, you can open the fridge. In God's house, you can open the pot. Why? It's your house. Did you hear me? It's your what? It's your house. In those days, once in a while, once in a year really, the chief priest will enter into the Holy of Holies, which is good. But guess what? In today, you are the Holy of Holies. You are not entering anywhere. Did you hear what I told you this morning? You don't need to break in anywhere. You are the house of God. It is in you he dwells. He lives in you. Do you understand that? It is you he chose to stay in. So you don't need to enter into any... You, you, you are the place. Because there's a confidence we need to have in prayer. And this affects the language with which we pray. Some of you, when it's time to pray, you begin to pray like a poor person. Like a pauper, a destitute in the spirit. You don't even want to, your words to be heard. Sons don't talk to their fathers like that. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? The presence of God is majestic, but you are a son. Pray like who you really are. You know, true repentance is returning you to the consciousness of who you really are in Christ. Do you know that? Do you know that? So when Paul was to even rebuke a sexual sin in the Corinthian church, he said to them, Know ye not that you are the temple of God. That's who you are in God. So don't pray as though you should not be praying. Don't pray as though it's not people like you that pray. Don't pray as though it's your last chance for God to hear you. Don't, none of those things. Pray boldly. Amen. Pray boldly. Because I'm a son. Say, I can confidently enter. Because I'm a son. So we'll do something this afternoon. Raise your hand where you are. Raise your hand. Stretch it to the heavens. Both your hands, please. Stretch both your hands to the heavens. Both in your heart and through your own physical head, I want your heart and your head to be turned to the heavens with your both hands stretched. Please just practice a little exercise. As you are there, I want you to take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath. No worries. Just take a deep breath. And I want you to imagine that God is just standing in front of you. In all of his glory. And I want you to remember that you are his son. You have a right to be here. You have a right of passage. Now without any hurry. But with conviction and boldness. I want you to call him my father. Just take a deep breath. Do it again. Say my father. 
Drop your hands and look at me. Let me tell you something. If you miss it at entrance, most likely you have missed the prayer completely. How you enter determines the way you pray. It even determines the words you use in prayer. Go help me now. You know they see. You know they see. To help me now. Me they know. That's not a song. That's not. See, at times Jesus prayed, we studied them. He stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus and said, Father, I thank you for you always hear me. That's not a person who thinks he's not supposed to be there. Sometimes we pray for divine favor, we should. We pray for the mercy of God, we should. But you see, God is not doing you a beggarly favor when you are praying. You know that's just come. No. He will show you his mercy. He will turn his mercy towards you and all of that, right? But please don't go to God as a poor child that they are allowed to just stand here by mistake. I say, no, don't give me food. Don't give me food. Only crumbs. Only crumbs. May I they go? It affects the language of your prayer. One of the things I want to show to many of us is that we have been praying like slaves all along. Every prayer said in fear is not a prayer. And most of the fall down and die prayer are said in fear. Fear in the other person's ability to harm you. Not in faith in God's ability to protect you. Did you understand what I just did there? You should have more faith in God's ability to protect you. See, some people, when they pray, they say, die. That guy is afraid for his life. That's, that prayer is a display of his fear. And that's because they do not enter the right way. Say, Father. Father. Say, try it again. Say, Father. How many of you are parents? You have children. It's only the men. Raise your hand. Raise it well. Raise it well. You have children. You have children. So, Felix, you know, it's your responsibility, not your son's responsibility, to protect himself. Do you know that? So, if you come home one day, you see your two sons, they're in a conference meeting at home in the room. They lock the door. They're planning. <laughs> and we listen to the conversation. So, guy, we need to protect ourselves. They get away the area B, so we need to. I didn't know for any sons. They're like this. So two of them are saying, we need to, we need to. See, when you come, lock the door behind you. I'll give you one key. The key is for you. I'll give one to daddy and mommy. So, make sure we are safe. You are laughing. <laughs> How does he feel? Or oh, one day you just come home and you see your elder son with battle us. <laughs> What's going on? He said, I have discovered our enemy on this street. Is that man. I'm going to ask him down. I will ask him down. Even you that is the father, you say, what of me? What do you have do? What of me? It's my job to protect. It's my job to protect. It's my job to even protect you from mosquito bites. Did you hear what I said? It's not just your father's job to protect you from big enemies. It's your father's job to protect you from mosquito bites. Oh, it's in it, a prayer. Oh. So there's some of the prayers we are praying. If I didn't know what it means. It means we don't believe we have a father. We are praying like bastards. Do you know how a child that has a father lives? It takes the father to even tell him not to be reckless. I hope you know that. A child that has a real daddy, there's a way they behave. There's a freedom they have. When their father is around, there's a way they are very confident. 
That is here now. Do you understand that? So guess what? A child that has a daddy is not living every day conscious of the enemy. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you see all those enemy conscious prayers are people who don't know they have a what? A daddy. If you have a daddy, you have a daddy. Oh. Your daddy will even anticipate Solomon was a good father in a sense. He didn't discipline his children as much. Oh. But do you know Solomon fought all the enemies? I mean David, sorry. Fought all the enemies Solomon could have. He killed the future enemy. Solomon, I mean, David killed the future enemies of Solomon. So much so that there was one, the own general, his captain, he said, you have to find a way to kill this guy. He took like fight. That's what a father does. A father. A father gave his son, Solomon, all the money he would need to build the temple. So don't go and also, don't sweat, just build. A father. So they are setting prayer. Give me Lord. Give me Lord. Hey, don't give me, I will die. You are praying that prayer because you don't know that you have a word. Jesus said, if you, being evil, know how to give your children good gifts. So one of the things that will happen in the course of this teaching series is, it gets some prayer where we go change. Did you hear me? Some people are teaching you how to fight. They're not teaching you how to pray like a son. There's some prayer you need to change. Take that illustration of Eli's son's home that he sees his son with a battle ass. What's he going to say? He's going to ask that man down. It's his enemy. So the father will not ask himself, what should I do? <laughs> what should be my job now? If my children are protecting themselves, my children are providing for themselves, my, are you getting the idea? I need to move somewhere else. I have a father who knows my needs. Rest all over. Peace with you. I have no care. I have, I have no worry. I have rest. Rest all over. Peace within. Peace within. I have a father. He knows, he my, knows need. my need. Rest all over. Rest all over. Peace within. Peace within. I have no care. Can you all sing the song in faith? I have no worries. Rest all over. Within, I have a father. I have a father. He knows my name. He knows my needs. Rest all over. Peace within. Listen to me, guys. Do you know? I said, find something that the Holy Ghost told me. Now, some prayers are actually a display of works. You can be praying in works. Works, works, works. Supply come when you enter rest. Can we all say thank you, Father? Can, I want us to sing that song just a, just a minute and then we'll close the service. In faith, in faith, can you raise your hand and sing the song this morning, afternoon? Rest all over, peace within. 